Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is our first session of the second year of the Oxford Virginia Legal Dialogues. We are excited to be able to open with such a thought provoking, if alarming, <laughs> paper. Um, before we begin, I'd like to make the introduction. So I'm Ruth Mason. I'm the, I'm the Edwin S. Cohen Distinguished Professor of Law and Taxation at the University of Virginia. Um, and I'm an affiliated faculty member with the Virginia Center of Tax Law. My co-convener for this series is Silly Dagan, known to all of you. She's a professor at uh, the University of Oxford Law School. And uh, she's one of the directors in the MSc in Taxation at Oxford. So by now, everybody knows our format. Uh, Silly and I pick a tax professor that we admire, who then picks a non-tax professor that they admire. Um, and then we invite this author to our Zoom and we have a discussion. Um, so let me introduce first our commentator for today. I don't think this person really needs an introduction to this group, but Wolfgang Schoen is the faculty director of the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Munich. It's for the Max Planck Institute for Tax Law and Public Finance. He's been a vice president of that organization, a member of the Permanent Scientific Committee of IFA and the uh, European Association of Tax Law Professors. He's chaired the OECD panel at IFA uh, during a period where I think we can all agree has been pretty exciting. Um, Wolfgang has been a visiting professor at NYU, uh, among other places, and he has written on book tax conformity. I mentioned this for the Americans at this particular moment. Um, but, uh, you know, given his position at the Max Planck Institute, he's no stranger to interdisciplinary studies. So I think he's a perfect person for us to have invited here. And he's you know, familiar with what Silly and I are trying to do with uh, this seminar, it's old hat for him. Um, Wolfgang's also written about tax and democracy. That was the subject of his Max Weber lecture. And his interest in this subject is probably what uh, led him to choose today's featured author. Uh, Rick Pildes. Uh, Rick is the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law. He's a leading constitutional law scholar and a specialist in issues concerning democracy. He clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall and is a member of the American Law Institute. And he's currently serving on the commission on the Supreme Court of the United States, having been appointed to that position by President Biden. Uh, in dozens of articles and in his acclaimed casebook, The Law of Democracy, Rick has helped create an entirely new field of study in law schools. We're lucky to have read part of this work in our, for our discussion today, uh, Political Fragmentation in Democracies Today. Before we move on to the discussion, I also want to mention that um, Rick works outside the academy. Uh, so he successfully argued voting, writing, voting rights cases and election law cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and uh, Courts of Appeals. He's also a well-known public commentator. He writes for the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, and he was part of the Emmy-nominated NBC breaking news team coverage for the 2000 Bush v. Gore contest. So welcome, Wolfgang and Rick. Uh, before we jump into the paper, I just want to say a word about the format. So uh, Wolfgang will comment, uh, Rick will respond, and then Silly and I will make some remarks before opening the conversation up. If you would like to be in the queue, use the raise hand function in your browser in your Zoom. Um, click on participants and then raise hand. Uh, this session is recorded, but only the first part, not the Q&A, will be posted if any of it's posted online, okay? Um, and then you can check out all of the past recordings for these sessions. They're all on the uh, on our website. Um, so please also let us know your name and institutional affiliation in the chat so that we can give that information to Rick after the session. So without further ado, Wolfgang. Yeah, thanks to Ruth, thanks to Tilly for inviting me and also on congratulating them on this format, which I think is really a wonderful thing. This is your second season. And it's absolutely something I love being a tax person who, who wants to go beyond tax in many respects. Now, um, thanks 
in particular to Rick for agreeing to join us here. We ran into each other a couple of times at NYU. And it is indeed my, my interest in taxation and democracy, which made me choose him and this paper for this uh, today's session. Um, this is indeed not a tax paper, but it speaks to tax academics. Because taxation is about redistribution within a given community, it's about financing public goods by a community, and this dis requires decision-making. So whenever you have tax, you need someone to decide on what to tax and how to uh, uh, allocate the revenue, et cetera. And then you are in the midst of the political system. So nobody, I think, should ever think about taxation without thinking about the political background, in particular, the constitution and its institutions. Whether you talk about Trump's tax reform in 2017 or the current deliberations about the Biden proposals in the House and in the Senate, this is talking about democracy. But I would like to go a bit further and, and state I'm not only an academic, I'm also a citizen in one of those Western democracies, which Rick so nicely described. So I'm widely interested in the future of my own country, of the United States as a political entity. And I'm quite happy and congratulations to Rick on all that comparative work you did, because this is really something where Europeans, uh, Americans, and many others can learn from each other's experiences. So what's the paper about? It's about what Rick calls political fragmentation. Political fragmentation leading to dysfunctionalities in political decision-making. And one of his examples is legislation. There is, he writes, less and less significant enactments in the United States. Now, some people might say, is this a problem? Some people might say less is more. And when I look at, let's say, the European Union and its institutions, I sometimes wish that less is more, because there can be underproduction and overproduction of legislation. But I think what you mean in the end is that democratic institutions should be able to address the most pressing issues within a polity to find compromises to settle things, at least for the medium term. And that's not happening in some of the countries you mentioned in your paper. What do you mean by political fragmentation? The, the, the hint you give is we are talking about dispersion of political power. Now that can mean a lot of things. Taking a closer look, we can talk about dispersion among institutional players, a president and a Senate and the House and what political economists call veto players. So all these institutions that can block decisions. You can take a look at the polity at uh, the people of a country and, and find more and more um, di di divisions and diversions here. And then we have a lack of gravitational pull exercised by traditional parties. We have a proliferation of smaller parties. We have more and more extremist parties in some cases. And we ha have, as you nicely described, these political entrepreneurs, which try to bypass traditional career trajectories, traditional democratic institutions. Uh, I, I, my position would be, well, fragmentation is a problem, but maybe polarization is an even bigger one. And this is not the same. In, in the United Kingdom, you have still a two-party system, but you have polarization under Brexit. In the US, you have still a two-party system, but you found your high watermark of polarization in the Trump administration. When you look at the most recent election in Germany, it's just a couple of weeks ago, uh, extremist parties were losing out. Uh, all those parties in the middle are somehow finding together. And uh, our, our still working Chancellor Merkel, her recipe for success was to a certain extent to integrate all their opponents' views into her own party program. So you can have a number of parties in the middle as long as they are willing to cooperate, even that kind of fragmentation can work. Now you, you very impressively compare systems shaped by proportional representation in continental Europe and those first past the post systems in the UK and in the US. I find this extremely interesting. And what you write about the time it takes in Europe to form coalition governments like in Spain or like in 
in, in Belgium, or just to mention Israel, this is really quite striking. Um, on the other hand, I sometimes think that one of the main reasons for the changes that happened in the recent decades was in the end the fall of the Iron Curtain, was the end of the Cold War. Uh, in continental Europe, you, you never lost this feeling of this communism, capitalism, antagonism um, of a political, a global political situation where parties did not go to the extremes. We did not have many leftist parties because of the existence of the Soviet Union. You did not have so many right-wing parties because memories of the Nazi regime were still quite fresh. And it was basically the 1990s when that cut loose and all the other parties came on the plane. Um, I learned from the paper, which I, and I very much uh, was impressed by that, that if you have a two-party system like in the UK and in the US, then you will have a lot of diversity within those parties. Uh, and that is, of course, what's also going to extremes in the current situation. Now, if I understand you correctly, the mere fact that you have a lot of diversity and a lot of divisions within parties does not mean that the system is blocked. What is needed then is what in the US, to my knowledge, has always been called bipartisanship. And so as long as you have some form of willingness to come together for bipartisan approaches, then diversity within the parties is fruitful and, and helpful because people feel integrated. But once you start polarizing parties against each other, that doesn't work anymore. Now, in the next part of your paper, uh, Rick goes into what he calls the structural causes for fragmentation, in particular, the lack or the loss of coherence between, let's say, center-left parties like the Social Democrats in, in Europe or the Democrats in the US being linked to the working class, while more right-wing or center-right parties like the Conservatives in Britain or in, you know, the Christian Democrats in Germany would be linked to middle classes and upper classes. Why has that gone away? We see this not only in the Trump situation, you also see this in Boris Johnson, who, who smashed the, what they called the Red Wall in the, in the UK Midlands by taking over a lot of safe seats from Labour. Again, I would, would like to refer to that to that erosion of the Cold War situation when capitalist and communist concepts were pitted against each other, because this was not just about two superpowers. This was, in my view, also about two master narratives. This was about two ways to explain the world, whether you are on a trajectory that leads you into paradise by more or less socialist ideas or more or less libertarian capitalist ideas, now that has gone down. Communist broke down first, discrediting many forms of socialist dreams. Capitalism stayed on, but as we now know, wasn't able to deliver a better life to everyone. In many cases, there have been downgradings. You refer in your paper, Rick, to the loss of millions of jobs in the US, while millions of people in China got a better life. Now, social democrats, as you rightly say in the 2000s, try to find a better way, like Tony Blair, Gerhard Schröder, uh, Bill Clinton, and others. But again, they did not meet all the expectations. So what is missing now, and this is, in my view, part of the reason for the fragmentation you describe, there is no clear way out anymore. There is an economic situation where many people do not see that master narrative anymore, which might provide a better overall situation for them. So you do not have a coherent agenda addressing a coherent community. And, um, and again, in most democracies, um, politics was quite easy as long as there was a big surplus to, to distribute, but these good old times have gone. So in my view, there's also an economic story behind that, not only a political story, uh, that 
simply no party is able to offer a clear way out of the current situation. Uh, as you absolutely correct and, and superbly describe, Rick, social Democrats in Europe or Democrats in the US have to a certain extent left behind their clear focus on the well being of the working classes. And there are kind of two additional work streams here. One is globalization. Uh, social Democrats embraced globalization in the 1990s, and this included a very liberal view as to immigration. Now, immigration might run uh, uh, into the face of the existing working class, and in so far, social democrats have, as you rightly described, lost out. The second work stream, which I would like to add, is sustainability, the program of greening the economy, because again, it's the traditional industries like coal and steel losing out. Now, once you try in a, in a center-left party to combine internationalist views, pro-immigration, pro-globalization, and pro-sustainability, then of course, the working class as it existed before is on the other side. But again, this is not simply an element of the political system. In my view, it's economic forces in the background driving that reality. When I look at my own country in the leftist party, the Linke, there is a bitter divide between those who want simply to protect the domestic working class and others who adhere to the internationalist view, which has always been part of the international socialist movement. The biggest problem seems to be that the expectation gap as to what politicians can deliver against the background of the economic and environmental overall situation is rising and rising, and nobody knows how to feed that gap. As you impressively tell us in your paper, Rick, the very same people who voted for Obama under the Yes, We Can slogan uh, went for Trump under the America First slogan because they simply expected to get out of their miserable situation. So the number of disappointed people will rise and rise, and this will open up avenues for ever more extreme positions and conspiracy theories will come up and outright nonsense as well. And my, my, my feeling is this brings up not only differences as regard political interests. So we are not only pitting different interest groups against each other here, we are pitting different perceptions of reality against each other here. And I think Americans know much better than I what it means to live in a world where people simply do not accept the same facts. I, I remember that Senator Moynihan famously once said, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but nobody to their own facts. And this, you're beyond that statement in the US, but also of course, in some part, of Europe. Now, in this context, Rick, I find your analysis of modern means of communications quite insightful and, and fascinating because social media contribute to that kind of culture. On the one hand, they stress the participatory element of politics. People are really getting engaged. On the other hand, it gives room to all sorts of manipulation, including rights. There are bubbles coming into existence. And that what we really mean by talking about democracy, meaning a broad discourse across all relevant groups, that does not happen anymore. And I think there are two points which you make here, which I find particularly interesting and, and insightful. The first point refers to the lack of organization and the lack of a coherent platform that is required to form or to, to, to exercise political pressure in these informal groups, because that enables people who are simply angry to communicate and to express themselves. You do not need an alternative platform or a coherent agenda. You are just angry. Um, and again, you might be angry at something which politicians cannot change because we are talking about much larger developments of the economy and the environment. 
Uh, the second point refers, uh, and I, I didn't know anything about that before I read your paper, about the relative ease for individuals to set up parties in no time and to control them. Uh, Rick describes how Beppe Grillo in Italy and Nigel Farage in the UK single-handedly created parties, which are completely in a legal sense dependent on their founders. So Grillo, uh, obviously being in control of the brand name of the Five Star Movement, while Nigel Farage was the main shareholder of the Brexit party. Uh, in some countries like Germany, such a thing would have been forbidden. So you, this would be prohibited. You cannot control a party, but I live in a country where you can't even own a football soccer club. So um, um, in the end, we, we always like these, these collective structures. Another element which was not clear to me before I read Rick's paper is this category of free Asian politicians. I mean, this is what, what political economists call the, the political entrepreneur. Um, and this seems to have taken center stage. Of course, we in Europe learned a lot about Trump, but what I learned from your paper is that he was preceded by quite a number of individuals who made their political career bypassing all those traditional steps and decision-making bodies and, and levels within the party framework. I even learned that I have to buy this memoir of John Biner, which seems to be fascinating with all those anecdotes you mentioned. But of course, we have some examples like that as well. So Emmanuel Macron basically created a party just to, to win the presidential election, which he duly did. Uh, and we have more and more situations in Europe where party chairpersons are no longer accepted if they are simply appointed by some leading body, by some board or by some closed group. And, and in a couple of weeks, even the Christian Democrats in Germany will have a, a sounding with the membership to find out who shall be the successor to the unhappy incumbent. Um, but of course, it's very easy for that kind of political entrepreneur to present themselves as an alternative to the establishment swamp or whatever name they want to use here. Um, so when I take a final look at the manifold developments, Rick, in your paper, um, I ask myself whether fragmentation is truly the umbrella term for this. In, in my view, there are two elements which you describe very nicely. Um, one is polarization, and one is what might be called disintermediation. So a disrespect for the institutions of representative democracy, there is more and more things going towards direct democracy, where you have individual politicians addressing directly what they call the people. So the populist movement, while the, the attenuating and, and filtering effects of representative democracy are now more and more sidelined. So what am I going to make of it? I had a talk a couple of months ago with a German sociologist and, and his story was, his storyline was the following. Around 100 years ago, people were told now democracy is coming and you will get two things. You will participate in the political process and you will gain economically. Now that went hand in hand for 100 years, but now there are not many economic gains to be distributed anymore. So his theory was, and now people say, the second bit I got, the political participation, this is what I'm now taking much more serious. And this is why we have these grassroots movements. And this is why populists are so popular, etc. This creates room for direct democracy. And I, I read your paper as pleading for maintaining the value of representative institutions, and I'm fully on your side on that. And now I'm looking forward to your comments. Thanks. Now, is it uh, to me or is it to Ruth and Seeley first? To, to you, Rick. To me, okay. 
Uh, well, first of all, um, thanks, of course, for, for drink, drawing me into this or bringing me in, into this. I love uh, both the interdisciplinary kind of nature of this and, and of course, the international uh, dimension. Um, it, and this is you know, sort of what academic life uh, is like at its best uh, to be able to have these kinds of conversations. It's also fun for me to see a number of people I know on this uh, or people who I haven't met, but whose work I've read. <laughs> so that's also a, a plus for me. Um, I'll try not to talk for too long because I think it's it's better to get into conversation as quickly as we can. Um, you know, let me say a few overview um, words about kind of how I how I understand what um, what this project is about. Um, so at the largest level, I think that one of the principal challenges to the democracy of the West, of the West these days is actually being able to deliver effective government for large numbers of citizens. Um, I think it's quite interesting that President Biden here very self-consciously actually defines that as his historic role. He has now several times said um, that, that his position is to show not just to the United States, but more generally that democracies can effectively deliver for their citizens. And of course, the fact that he has to define his role in that way you know, tells you quite a lot uh, about the anxieties um, that are running through a lot of these um, democracies. Uh, and in political and legal theory, about democracy, we don't tend to talk about effective governance, uh, actually, as, as one of the important political values in the way we think about designing and organizing and evaluating our institutions. Uh, but I think that's a mistake. And, and I think events are forcing that uh, much more into our awareness as a central thing we have to think about um, in terms of the design of, of the processes. I am Kind of an institutionalist. I do tend to think very institutionally about the organizations of democracy. Um, now, why is it across so many of the Western democracies uh, that we seem to be in this period where there's widespread perceptions that governments are not able to deliver effectively? Um, and what I, what I see in, at, at one level, as, as Wolfgang was pointing out, is a tremendous fragmentation, as I call it, of political power that's emerged over the last 20 some years across a lot of democracies. Um, we don't always tend to see this as something that, that is uh, existing across democracies because the fragmentation takes different forms in different political systems. Um, but uh, in the European systems, uh, the PR systems, you know, we have seen the disaffection from the two dominant parties or coalitions of the left and right that basically govern in most of these countries since World War II. You know, we see the, the, the alienation from those parties or those coalitions. Uh, we see that alienation sometimes taking the form of significant withdrawal from political participation, which is what we saw among working class voters in places like the US and the UK. Uh, until Brexit and Trump in 2016, uh, when a lot of those voters returned to participation. Um, we see it in the rise of a lot of the smaller new insurgent parties, some on the right, some on the left, some with very different kinds of, uh, of views. Um, and the further sort of manifestations of that in the PR systems is uh, you know, the much greater difficulty of finding governing majorities, of being able to form coalitions, uh, the much greater likelihood those coalitions are uh, incoherent to an extent because you have to bring together the Greens and the uh, free, uh, I forgot, the FDP or what's it called uh, in Germany, the, uh, the Liberal Party. Uh, but in other countries, you know, similar kinds of incoherent coalitions uh, that makes it more difficult uh, or can make it more difficult for those governments to deliver effective policy. Uh, it will make those governments uh, more fragile, uh, more likely to fall to votes of no confidence. Uh, we see in a number of these systems, you know, the more extreme expressions of that, like in Spain, where the two dominant parties had, had 
governed for, you know, since, since Spain had become a democracy. And by the, the, the last decade, um, Spain ends up that just fragments uh, and we have six parties or so leading to elections that are indecisive, governments get formed, they barely last, they fall. I forgot four elections in three or four years in Spain. You know, so those are some of the manifestations of this dispersal of political power away from the traditional institutional structures that help to organize and channel and give content and bring effectiveness to the political process, the, the dominant political parties. Uh, in the US, because uh, of the two-party system, you know, fragmentation doesn't take the form of uh, third or fourth parties uh, rising up. It's just the, the, the disincentives are too strong given the, the structural incentives of the first past the post elections. But what you see is the internal fragmentation of our two major parties with all sorts of consequences. So the more extreme version of this is that when the Republican Party was uh, in charge of the US House, um, the Republican Speaker of the House twice basically was thrown out of office by his own Republican members because they were, there was too much division uh, over the direction of the party. Um, on the Democratic side, of course, we're seeing this right now uh, as the Democrats are you know, fractured internally between the moderates and the progressives, um, which has led them uh, uh, to be unable to do anything for four months after President Biden managed to put together a huge bipartisan deal in the Senate on infrastructure. Uh, and instead, there's kind of this self-destructive uh, dynamic that's taking place over the last four months uh, that, you know, I think is partly responsible for the, the bloodbath that the Democratic Party took in our elections um, on Tuesday. Not the only cause, but part of it. Um, so in general, I, I, there's a you know, very strong link between these, this, this challenge of providing effective government and the reality of how much more fragmented politics and political parties have become. Uh, and as I say, um, the fragmentation is partly a reflection of the inability or dissatisfaction with governments being able to deliver effective policy that leads to searches for other alternatives, but at the same time, perhaps perversely, that very fragmentation makes it all the harder for governments to go ahead and be able to put together the concerted power that's necessary to move these systems um, to actually deliver. And you know, just in response quickly to Wolfgang's initial comment, um, and I think he recognized this in the, in the comment, um, you know, it's not an issue about uh, the number of laws generated per se. It's uh, and, and it's hard, of course, to define metrics for effective governance and delivery of effective governance. Uh, but in the U.S., uh, I think some of the best metrics that that political scientists have come up for this look at things like um, uh, the issues that voters identify as the ten most urgent issues, or other measures of the most salient issues for voters. Um, and then um, on what percentage of those issues does Congress end up legislating over the next you know, four or five years? And you can look historically and compare the present with you know, 30, 40 years ago. And, and there are dramatic differences, um, at least in the, uh, in the US. Um, and I think, as I say in the paper, this issue of fragmentation and, and effective governance is a, is, is a deeper and more pervasive issue than uh, the kinds of questions that we spend a lot of time thinking about now with what's going on among democracies in the, in the West. Um, you know, the issues of illiberal, the rise of illiberalism, uh, the, the worries about democratic backsliding, um, uh, the role of various populist forces uh, in different countries, all of that's true and important. Um, but the fragmentation is something that I see as, as pretty pervasive not limited to a few countries um, that have had um, uh, already gone through a certain amount of democratic backsliding, you know, Poland, Hungary, you know, the two, the two ones uh, uh, that people focus on the most. Um, in other places, there are anxieties about that, including here in the US. Uh, but, uh, but this seems to me an enormous challenge. And the, the paper goes on to then try to uh, look at what the, 
underlying causes of all of this fragmentation might be. Some of them are large economic, cultural kinds of forces. Um, a lot of them tied to the way uh, uh, the political parties or coalitions of left and right uh, are now uh, essentially inverted from what they had been ever since World War II uh, with all this you know, movement across these traditional party identities and uh, uh, working class voters, at least white working class voters, <laughs> voters are lower economic status, lower educational levels who used to traditionally be the base of the parties of the left um, now having moved to the parties of the right uh, and the parties of the left having become the parties of the higher educated, more affluent voters. Um, and in the United States, at least uh, a significant portion of minority voters. Um, and a lot of people have written about those larger forces. The thing I want to bring to the table here is uh, I don't think we've appreciated how much the communications revolution is also a major driver of the kind of fragmentation these democracies are struggling with. Uh, we are you know, very focused on the issues of disinformation in the social media system, or maybe misinformation, um, or you know, amplification of this or that. Um, but I think the challenges the communications revolution poses to democracies is much more profound than those issues or put another way if we could even if we could handle those issues could find some way to manage those issues whether it's self-regulation by the platforms or government regulation of one sort or another um, I, I think the fragmenting forces that the communications revolution unleashes on politics are are would still be there would be very profound um, and very difficult for the political system to sort of manage um, and I have more familiarity with this in the United States. Uh, and so let me just make one point uh, to link that to the larger story and then I'll stop so we can actually engage in conversation. Um, if you want to know why the Democrats, if you've you know, been following the, the, the drama, if you will, uh, over months here uh, about whether the Democrats will, will bring their progressive and moderate forces together to enact major economic and social legislation. Um, one of the things you may have noticed is that the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, has several times promised a vote on a specific date on these issues and then been unable to hold the vote because she realized she would not be able to get a majority and you know, as a Speaker of the House, you don't put something on the floor that's gonna get voted down. Uh, you have the president asking for this to be done. You have the Speaker of the House, the two most powerful Democrats, two of the three most powerful Democrats uh, trying to bring this together and they can't. And why is that? And it's in part because there have always been factions and differences within political parties, particularly in the two party system of the United States. But there used to be ways that political leaders had tools, leverage, power to kind of bridge those divides and keep the party as a kind of organized structure and bring along recalcitrant members once party leaders had decided some deal was in the interest of the party as a whole. And Nancy Pelosi simply does not have that kind of leverage anymore over members who are only in office one, two, three, four years. This is also remarkable. The, the people resisting making a deal and, and the terms of the deal are actually fairly obvious and have been fairly obvious for four months. Um, but, uh, but one wing of the Democratic Party in the House, the progressive wing, has been resisting that deal. Uh, many of them are recently in office. Those ought to be the most vulnerable members, the members who are most dependent on the leadership uh, or would have been in the past. And, and the reason they're not now is the communications revolution, at least in my view. They are able to raise money for themselves for running for office through the internet, through social media, they don't have to be on important committees to have extremely high profiles, as many of them do. 
they are on Twitter, they are on other social media platforms, they are on cable television, which is part of the communications revolution. Um, they are they are able to, to, to act as, as I said, as, as Wolfgang mentioned, independent political free agents, unconstrained in a major way by the party structure. They don't have to work their way up through the party structure to get to a certain level where they have a profile um, and, and can um, stand on their own. They can do that almost as soon as they come into office. And that means what, what is it Nancy Pelosi can threaten to do to them? Not much. Uh, and so that's part of the fragmentation within the party structure in the US. Now our politicians you know, are much freer in some ways of a party structure than they are in, in many of the PR systems. Uh, but in any event, that's, that's just a, a point about what's going on right now, how the communications revolution helps explain that, how the, what you're seeing is a manifestation of this fragmentation. And of course, what it's producing is this tremendous struggle about whether with unified control of the government, which rarely happens in the US now, can the Democratic Party actually deliver? Um, now, I assume eventually it will, but it, it's, it's going to have damaged itself enormously in this long drawn out process of trying to get there. Uh, and it just would not, and, and in my view, this was not how things would have happened in the pre-fragmentation, pre-communications revolution age. So let me stop, stop there. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Wolfgang, did you wanna respond directly to that or? Uh, well, well, just, just two sentences. First of all, I absolutely agree with Rick that this emergence of this free agent really makes a difference. Uh, and that it's way harder to contain these people or even to organize a compromise among these people or with these people than in the past. On, on the other hand, I still think that the issues at hand may have become more complicated than in the past when we, are, we were only talking about rich countries being well organized which did not have a demographic problem, which did not lose millions of jobs to Asia, et cetera. And uh, in so far, I think things are coming together. The emergence of these free agents might also be a result of the lack of credible answers to the questions people have out there in the current situation. Rick, did you want to respond or shall? No, I want to. I want to hear what <laughs> yeah. you guys have to say. Okay, great. So, um, to participants, if you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function on uh, Zoom, um, and please let us know your institutional affiliation by putting it into the chat. Um, so, Rick, thanks so much for this paper. Like the discussion has already been so interesting. Um, you know, I, I hadn't paid attention to those quotes that you pull out from President Biden, um, I find them really unnerving. Um, you know, you have the President of the United States essentially talking about existential threat to democracy and that he sees himself as pushing back against that. Um, and then, you know, to see that this is not something that's just happening in the United States, that it's across system and across type of system uh, was really uh, interesting for me. And so I'm glad to have this paper, you know, we tax people tend sometimes get bogged down in the minutiae and it's nice to sort of be brought out to a, a higher level. Um, overall, I find the, the argument persuasive. Um, fragmentation to me is clearly an important part of the story. And I think I agree under emphasized. Um, I also agree about social media and its role in fragmentation um, and that regulation of social media is unlikely to make much of a difference. Um, you know, we tax people tend to think that, you know, anything can be solved with a Pigouvian tax or subsidy. And I just think, you know, the genie is out of the bottle on this one and there's no tax that's gonna put it back in. Um, so, you know, one issue I wanna raise um, because I'm sure it's on the mind at least of the Americans is this reconciliation bill and you've already talked about it. Um, 
you know, for people outside the US who aren't following this, um, including in this bill are the pillar two changes. So Rick, pillar two is just OECD jargon for the corporate minimum tax proposal. And this proposal has widespread international support, um, but in the United States, it's gonna be enacted under this you know, particular legislative procedure, reconciliation that's subject to some pretty tight restrictions. And the reason why the Democrats who control the government, right, are using reconciliation is to bypass a Senate filibuster. And you know, the Democrats have razor thin majorities. Well, there's no majority in the Senate. Every Democrat has to vote in favor and there's a really slim majority in the House. Um, and so, you know, the reconciliation bill is expected to pass if it passes with zero bipartisan support. Um, you know, and this is not just a Democrat thing. In 2017, the Republicans too passed a, you know, a tax bill in the literal dead of night with no Democrat support or input. Um, you know, so this raises a couple of additional risks that could be part of your analysis as you go forward with this, I think, critical project, right? So you know, fragmentation doesn't only make government less able to deliver, but it also introduces kinds of pathologies to the legislative process. And you talk about the abandonment of regular order in congressional committees, but it, fragmentation also forces what might be called um, procedural innovation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, now everything has to pass through reconciliation, which means that every provision has to affect revenue and it's just highly restrictive. Um, and then, you know, another place you could see this is the other part of this big international deal, which the tax people call pillar one. Um, this is just a, a new tax nexus for, for international tax. But this has, you know, large support, 137 countries agreed to this. And, you know, normally a change like this would, would happen in the United States through treaty, either a multilateral treaty or, you know, through updates to bilateral treaties. But, you know, the worry is 67 votes in the Senate for ratification. So instead the Democrats are talking about, you know, they're getting creative and they're talking about using congressional executive agreement or something that requires, um, you know, fewer votes. So basically we see government trying to substitute less accountable legal forms for more accountable legal forms. And this is to get at, to, to get around, right? Political, well, in part polarization, but in part uh, fragmentation. Um, you know, so this, you know, raises the question of whether these changes can endure beyond the current party that's in power. And I would guess that this is not the, the United States is not the only place uh, where this is happening. Um, so another example of secret Congress might be the flight to international law. So I think it's pretty clear that the Biden administration is using this international tax deal, you know, not exactly to tie Congress's hands, but at least to strongly influence the outcome on the tax rate. And I think you see the same thing in Europe. So France and Germany can't get Ireland to do what they want on the uh, on these big tax harmonization projects or on digital taxation. So they turn to the OECD forum and they try to get the Americans to bludgeon Ireland into submission. And then that's what happens, um, you know, and compared to internal processes, these international forms of policy making are way less transparent, way less accountable. You know, there's no C-SPAN for the OECD. Um, and so you can see multilateralism as a kind of self-help self tool to combat fragmentation on the national level or maybe on the, you know, on the E, e level. Um, you know, no one is going to tweet no one who's not on this call is gonna tweet anything about anything that happens at the OECD and the Committee on Fiscal Affairs. It's completely uh, opaque uh, and so insulated from the communications revolution, right? So you have to find ways to get out of the, the Twitterverse. Um, but then you have these unelected treasury and finance ministry officials essentially making policy, deliberating completely out of sight. Um, Another pathology is the amplification of the voice of the linchpin voters, the mansions and the cinemas. Um, so, you know, you may have policy churn and you may have 
unexpected results in this within party fragmentation, right? So Manchin is making all the decisions. And he's, he's in the dominant party. Um, I wonder too, if fragmentation can affect the other prong of David Runciman's story of the appeal of democracy, right? So as you say that, that Runciman argues that democracy is appealing for two reasons, right? It, it delivers benefits and that's a problem under fragmentation for the reasons you give. And then it offers you know, dignity and respect to citizens. Um, now that's probably about a, a formal voice in the political process, but you could tell a story about the corrosive effects of fragmentation and social media, the communications revolution on dignity and respect. Um, and they massively amplify indignities and disrespect. I mean, tax Twitter is a very nice place to be, but don't step one foot outside of tax Twitter or you will be very sorry. Um, and so you can sort of, this is to not just a social breakdown among citizens, right? The president of the United States can use his Twitter account to insult individual citizens and whole groups of citizens, right? Um, and you know, you, this kind of ties up with your story about the disdain of the political elites and the credentialed for those who don't have uh, those credentials, but you can see it right there in Congress. Um, so I don't know if this is a, a, a standalone paper or if it's part of a book, I mean, it's a very big idea. Um, and so I wondered, you know, if you have any recommendations, I'm guessing campaign finance reform, um, but you know, I mean, if it's, it, it, it's in proportionate representation systems, it's in for, first past the post, um, should states be smaller to minimize yeah. fragmentation? Um, you know, will remote work help so that we don't get concentrate, urban concentrations um, you know, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, is there any help for us? Is there any hope for democracy? Is Biden going to save us? Um, so that's some food, some food for thought. I don't know if you want to respond now or. <laughs> yeah, I'll respond to, to at least is some of this because um, I, I really, you know, like the observation uh, that one of the effects of fragmentation is to, uh, introduce pathologies, if you will, to the political process, because if it's impossible to move it through the traditional structures of Congress or parliaments uh, or the process, um, and there's demand, um, then there's inevitably going to be pressure to see if there are workarounds that can emerge. Um, and um, I don't know how many people have read, <coughs> read the paper or read the paper all the way through, but um, I do want to mention that something that you flagged that um, I realized it happened with the U.S. Congress that I had not fully understood until I, I really worked this through. Um, there had been complaints um, over 20, 30 years or so now that uh, Congress used to function in a way where there was more decentralization you know, there were individual committees, they specialized, they had expertise, they had developed a lot of knowledge about particular issues. Legislation would be initially developed in these committees, tested, discussed, modified. It would work its way up through the system. Then there would be amendments on the floor of the House or the Senate. Um, and this changed, this has changed dramatically. And we have a, a much more top-down and centralized Congress in which most of the major policies are worked out in the leadership office of whoever, whichever party is in charge with you know, major leaders of the party behind closed doors. They produce a massive bill. Um, it then gets sent out with the understanding that sort of this is it um, and you're gonna vote for it. Um, there's much less deliberation. There's much less public uh, process and, a lot of, and there's been a lot of criticism of that. But what people don't realize is there's a reason that, that, that this has happened. And it's not because legislative leaders suddenly got more power hungry than they had been in the past, because presumably they always uh, were very attuned to power. Um, but because with social media and the communications revolution, the more open process compounded by some very extreme transparency requirements we have in the United States that were adopted in the 70s, um, just the, the process be, has become so vulnerable to being blocked at early stages before deals and trade-offs and negotiations can be made 
um, that it's really power that, that the Congress sort of figured out um, that this is part of what made it more paralyzed. And so as a response, this centralization of policymaking in the leadership uh, was meant to insulate the process from transparency, not for sinister kinds of reasons, but because um, in the communications age that we're in, that kind of insulation came to be viewed as, as necessary uh, to be able to actually get things uh, done. Um, and, uh, you know, with treaties in the US, this is actually a much longer problem. This problem goes back much longer because the Constitution you know, has this two thirds requirement for approval of treaties. Um, so we have stopped having significant international agreements done by treaty for quite a while now. Um, it's so rare to be able to get that level of support. Um, you know, just as an aside, I've written about this quite a bit, but the, when the constitution was formed, um, the hope was that political parties wouldn't emerge and political parties were thought to be <clears throat> kind of antithetical to the kind of democracy or Republican governance that was hoped to be created. Of course, that turned out to be a misunderstanding of how politics would work in a modern society. We do get parties. Um, and as the parties developed and, 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 and then particularly hardened over time, uh, you know, rules that were thought to promote wise decision making, like a two thirds requirement, became insurmountable because of partisan conflict. Um, because so much of politics got organ came to be organized through the parties. But, but in any event, I like, I like the general point uh, about process distortions that uh, uh, themselves reflect these forces of fragmentation. And I want to think about that more. I'll save any response to the plea for salvation uh, to, uh, uh, to later on, because maybe other people will ask questions along those lines. Celie? <laughs> Yeah, um, so uh, I, I'd like to join uh, Ruth and thank you both, both and, and, and you, Rick, for joining us today. I think I speak for both Ruth and myself uh, in saying that when we envision this series of, of uh, um, workshops, this is the, the kind of, of interaction we were looking for. So not only both of them long lasting uh, interest in, in taxation and democracy, uh, but when I read your, your paper, Rick, I, I thought it was, uh, exactly the kind of, of interaction we're looking not only between uh, different disciplines uh, within law, but also the international perspective and the comparative perspective. I think so many of us found ourselves, uh, you know, in, the, in this paper, our state, ourselves and our states in, in this paper, uh, for better or worse. Uh, and not surprisingly, you know, maybe I would like to take this uh, uh, opportunity to, to comment on the international perspective. Um, and I have uh, uh, two comments. One of them actually uh, closely resembles what Ruth was thinking about, and we didn't discuss this before, which is uh, interesting. But I was wondering whether the international arena um, is significant, uh, it, it, both in amplifying the, the problem of, of fragmentation, but possibly also by offering ways to, to contain it. Um, so, my, so my first uh, um, comment actually goes on, on the amplifying the, the, the problem and, and the problem and it focuses on, on fragmentation. And I read your, your paper um, as uh, one that highlights the uh, fragmentation of voice, right? And the voice versus exit uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and, and I would like to, to highlight another dimension of fragmentation, and I think tax law makes it uh, uh, very clear, uh, but, it's, uh, but I don't think tax is in any way uh, unique uh, in that law, and that's the fragmentation of exit options. Um, so what we're used to, to thinking about um, exit in, in binary terms, right? So a person is, is uh, is a part of a political community of a state or when she decides to expatriate, uh, she's no longer a member of, of such a community. Uh, and, and the paper, of course, very neatly describes the, the new rifts that the, this uh, difference between people uh, creates between the anywheres and the somewheres. And I really like that uh, uh, part in, in the paper that uh, describes that. Um, but as text law uh, have, has made uh, clear, 
some constituents don't have to make this binary choice and they are actually able to diversify their affiliation with, with the state. And uh, this actually makes exit itself a, a fragmented option. So when constituents can diversify their interaction with states, that is when they can simultaneously reside, invest, vote, pay taxes, work, and do business in any number of states, they enjoy uh, both greater flexibility, uh, but also a greater ability to influence state policies and to influence uh, state politics. And this is not only through voice, but also through partial exit, or sometimes the threat of exit is, is enough uh, for that, as, as in the case of, of uh, foreign direct investment, for example. So if, for example, they, they don't like a specific policy of country A, they don't have to fight uh, or challenge it in the political arena. In many cases, they can simply opt out of this particular policy. And again, tax provides a, a very good example for that. So um, Wolfgang was starting his, his uh, comments with referring, and I think rightfully so, to the issue of redistribution. Right, so if I don't like redistribution, I could fight the political fight uh, to lower the taxes, or I could opt out of the system by tax planning. So at least prior to the recent uh, developments in international taxation, uh, this further undermines the, the ability of the government to promote policies that would actually uh, serve the, the public good. The second point I wanted to make, and this is again, uh, goes to uh, very closely to, to what Ruth was talking about, uh, is that for better or worse, the international arena uh, offers domestic policymakers uh, an option to increase their power. Uh, and, and the idea is, uh, you know, Putnam's uh, two-level game, when, when uh, domestic political actors may, may be cooperating with parallel actors in foreign countries across national borders, right? Um, and, and this may help them twist the arms of domestic stakeholders in a certain way. And again, one example uh, that, my, that may demonstrate this is the, is the US joining or indeed leading uh, the global minimum tax, right? Uh, just to cite the New York Times from a few days ago, the, the, the headline said, uh, Biden uh, finds raising corporate tax rates easier abroad than home. Okay, so that's, I think that's a really good example of of how international leverage allows domestic politicians to actually uh, get their way in terms of policy. Now, the results of such moves could be good or bad, you know, when you're looking at it from a normative perspective, uh, they could help governments raise taxes that are desperately needed to, to help the, the government raise taxes, you know, for vaccine or, or uh, to sustain the, the environment, the environment, but they can obviously also help the government raise taxes uh, to, to finance undesirable levels and, of course, a whole range of other policies. Um, and, and as you mentioned in, in, in the paper, the, these uh, leverages can, can actually empower democratically elected uh, leaders, but also uh, dictators. Uh, but my point is that whatever they are, uh, these leverages are actually a way to uh, to use the international arena in order to increase domestic power. And, and that may uh, be a, a way forward on, on kind of fight, fighting these fragmentations. Well, so I, I really like the idea of um, using Hirschman to, to sort of organize, you know, uh, a way of seeing things here that I'm writing primarily about fragmentation on the voice uh, option. And I, I don't think I've really thought about it on the exit. Uh, side. Um, uh, and, you, and you offer and you offer some you know interesting examples about that uh, <laughs> with the, 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 the no the, the rejection of the simple binary kind of idea of where you're a citizen and what that means. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how much um, I mean those issues seem to me, uh, ones that at least in, in principle could be managed by policy if policymakers were, were, were willing to address them and have the political capability to do it. Um, you know, rules about attributing income here or there. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how 
how deep the fragmentation of the exit option that you're talking about kind of runs as a challenge to modern democracies, um, because um, uh, we are close. You know, some we do sometimes close some of these uh, arbitrage opportunities. Um, it ha it has been a problem, obviously, as you know better than me, in the international tax arena with with business. Uh, but anyway, it's an interesting question to think about. Um, do we have more fragmentation uh, on these sort of exit front? <clears throat> Presumably globalization, you know, the openness uh, uh, to the movement of capital at least uh, obviously creates more opportunities for what you're describing. Um, but as I say, my first instinct at least is that I can imagine policy solutions to that, whereas the things I'm trying to describe here, going back to Ruth's question, uh, are much more daunting uh, in terms of thinking uh, uh, about whether this is our fate and this is the kind of democracies we're going to experience in this era or whether there are uh, significant uh, changes externally, internally, matters of policy or not that may kind of change the dynamic I'm trying to describe here. Um, thank you so much. And to everyone else, you know, we can't sign you up. You have to sign yourselves up for the emails. So if you're not getting the invitations, go on the website and sign yourself up and then you'll get the invitations in the future. So thank you to everyone. And I hope to see you next time. <laughs>